The Inner Workings of the Supreme Court, Political Science 358, American Judicial Process, the Supreme Court. Well, today we're going to do some straightforward, non-deep uh, uh, lecture material. And it's straightforward because it's basically understanding the inner workings of the Supreme Court. Um, it's nice at times not to have uh, very deep or philosophically or theoretically deep um, material. So let's begin. Now, the presidential selection uh, s uh, system for Supreme Court and other federal court judges is laid out in Article 2, uh, Section 2, Clause 2. That's Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2. And it gives the president the power to, and I quote, by and with advice and consent of the Senate to appoint judges of the Supreme Court. Now, this is important because the Senate does have a role, as we see currently with the Gorsuch nomination. But the Senate role has been reduced basically to consent. Uh, it had a much further, uh, uh, deeper role in the prior century. But since the president really only seeks the advice on lower level judges from the Senate, the higher level judges and the Supreme Court nominees, it's reduced basically down to consent. Now, we had a thing called senatorial courtesy. We still do on the books. In cases of lower level judges, a senator may invoke senatorial courtesy. And it's really no courtesy. Uh, what it basically says is the Senate is given the courtesy of blocking the nomination of a judge whose court resides in a state that the senator represents. And it hasn't been used with Supreme Court nominations for over a century. When it is used, it's normally a lower level federal judge. Now, from our murky roots, we have a discussion of the selection, presidential selection of court judges. Federalist Papers number 66, written by Alexander Hamilton, New York State's representative to the Constitutional Convention. Um, just listen to his words. They, the Senate, may defeat one choice of the executive and oblige him to make another, but they cannot themselves choose. They can only ratify or reject the choice he may have made. So you see the role that the Senate plays. It's in the it's in the back. It's in the background. Uh, they can reject one or two, but it goes back to the president to make yet another nomination and onwards. Now, in terms of presidential nomination, there is an unseen process going on. And most presidents, once they swear the oath of office, they already have a small list of potential Supreme Court nominees in their back pocket. And they carry it around with them, typically. Um, modern presidents in the initial phase um, normally delegate these initial phases of selection to the attorney general, the chief of staff, or other top advisors. In other words, it's their job to isolate potential candidates. Obviously, the president reviews these uh, initial candidates in the initial phase. But uh, the work is carried out mostly by the attorney general, chief of staff, or top advisors. Now, we also ask, ask the president also asks, initial recommendations from politicians, from legal professionals, and interest groups. And most of these um, support criteria are filtered through the Justice Department's Office of Legal Policy. Um, the Office of Legal Policy reviews all of these um, uh, materials that is uh, come from politicians, legal professionals, and interest groups in uh, basically vetting, if you will, the uh, presidential selection. The president then and his advisors will then pass the names of one or more of the top candidates 
to the FBI for what was known as an exhaustive background search. Exhaustive. Um, the reason for this is uh, you can't have any skeletons in your closet. And normally the list of Supreme Court nominees normally numbers about 8 to 10. And most of those have gone through an initial exhaustive background search. Oops. Uh, during this background search, the FBI focuses more on malfeasance, not on nonfeasance, but malfeasance on the part of an unofficial nominee instead of on competence. It's malfeasance. Is there any wrongdoing? But even in this supposed exhaustive FBI background search, uh, such um, hinky things started to happen. For instance, the, F the FBI background search didn't uncover that Clarence Thomas, for example, praised the anti-Semitic black leader, Louis Farrakhan, the head of the Nation of Islam, while he chaired the e Equal Employment Opportunities Commission. And most of the issues while he was chair of that commi commission with Anita Hill and the like uh, wasn't brought to light until the Senate held hearings. Finally, the final choice is the president himself. The president is finally lobbied with choices. And he's lobbied by close friends and advisors. For instance, Attorney General Edwin Meese, uh, who worked under uh, um, both Nixon and Bush one, lobbied hard for Robert Bork, a very strong uh, strict constructionist. He also lobbied hard for Daniel Ginsburg, not the Ginsburg we have on the court, Daniel Ginsburg, uh, who turned out to be a pot smoker with his law students. So that kind of, he had to withdraw his nomination. Nixon was lobbied just as hard for the selection of Harry Blackman from his childhood friend and then uh, Chief Justice Warren Burger. Nixon and Warren Burger were friends. And Warren Burger wanted to lobby for Harry Blackman to be added to the court. And in fact, one story, which has been um, supported by proof, is that former U.S. President William Howard Taft lobbied very hard for the selection of a chief justiceship, the chief justice of the Supreme Court, and the person he was lobbying for was himself, himself. So you see that there's unofficial lobbying going on by close friends, advisors, and the like. Now, what are some of the factors that affect the nomination of justices to the Supreme Court of the United States? We cannot deny that partisanship and ideology play a role. It would be nice to say, oh, no, 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 no. It's a reified era of law. We don't have to dirty or sully our hands with politics, but that would be in fact false. And it would be naive that the president isn't considering partisan and ideological impact of his selection. Because you gotta remember these selections, if you pick a justice who's young enough, these, um, these impacts can be felt for upwards of 20 or 30 years, okay? Now, one of the uh, traditions first began with our first president, George Washington. While in office, he selected 11 consecutive candidates or nominees for the court, all of them federalists. He wanted federalists since he was himself a federalist. Overall, speaking across the decades, 130 of 149 nominees, 130 of 145 nominees, 87% have come from the nominating president's party. But mere partisanship may not be enough. Many presidents have been quoted as seeking the real politics of a person. Um, Lodge, um, the foreign, sec uh, foreign minister or foreign, <laughs> foreign secretary for President Roosevelt assured Roosevelt that Oliver Wendell Holmes was in entire sympathy with our views, meaning progressive views under the New Deal. 
So it's not enough to be from the same party. You have to be part of the same real politics, uh, meaning you're on board with what the president or his policy stand for. Many times this boils down to specific issue orientations. For example, Reagan campaigned in 1980 as a campaign platform issue that once in office he would be he would select justices who would be harsh on crime, abhor, oppose abortion, and favor school prayer. Now, you can almost see this in, with Trump's uh, nominee of Gorsuch. He's not just um, a person that might be of his political ilk, whatever Trump's ilk is, but more so he's on board with key issues to the Christian right, the right wing of the Republican Party. This is what Reagan was to say. The proliferation of drugs has been part of a crime ep epidemic that can be traced to, among other things, liberal judges who are unwilling to get tough with the criminal element in our society. We don't need a bunch of sociology majors on the bench. Yes, Reagan said that. We don't need a bunch of sociology majors on the bench. What we need are strong judges who will aggressively use their authority to protect our families, communities, and way of life. Judges who understand that punishing wrongdoers is our way of protecting the innocent. Judges who do not hesitate to put criminals where they belong behind bars. So obviously these were the key issues for Reagan, and he was quite adamant about picking justices that would achieve those aims. Now, the nomination is not done within a vacuum. It's done in a political environment. Ideology, partisan, or issue orientation may not be the only determinants, but uh, he may actually need to show that his nominee won't lose. Losing a nominee before the Senate vote is a loss for the president. It's counted as weakness in the president. Thus, the president's sense of, of the political environment may be as important in making his selection as the candidate's own credentials. The best example of this was when Ford selected, um, uh, Gerald Ford selected Justice John Paul Stevens. Ford took, if you remember, Ford took office granting Nixon a presidential pardon. And there was a massive shift in the representation in the House and Senate from the Republicans to the Democrats in the wake of Watergate. And thus, um, he had probably some of the lowest first-term presidential support ratings from Gallup. The last thing he needed was another loss, in this case, a justice selection. So he didn't want to make a strong partisan choice. When Justice Douglas resigned from the court, Ford was looking at it, it with a Senate of 62 Democrats and 38 Republicans. And he knew that replacing Douglas, one of the most liberal judges of the day, uh, was a justice. Oh, by the way, <laughs> he knew Douglas because earlier his minority leader, Gerald R. Ford, had tried to impeach Justice Douglas and had failed. So what he had tried to do is pick somebody who could heal the wounds, the partisan wounds after Watergate. And he picked Justice Stevens. He's not a Democrat. He wasn't a Republican. He was a pragmatist. He didn't really use ideology in determination of his cases. A third factor is the prior experience of the Supreme Court justice. All of the justices have been attorneys, whether attending law school or writing the law. Uh, one of the most famous writing the law was Benjamin Cardozo, uh, Cardozo Law School. He never was a lawyer. He became a lawyer. Well, I guess he was a lawyer. He became a lawyer by working in his father's law firm. So he didn't have a legal education as much as a practical professional education. Now, all have some form of public service. Some of them were past senators, governors, and of course Taft being the one former president to sit on the court. 93 of the 147 nominees have occupied uh, prior judicial positions. That's 63%. 
This masks an interesting partisan difference, though, since 73% of Republican nominees have had past judicial experience, while only 50% of the Democrat nominees have had prior judicial experience. A fourth factor is geography. According to the Judiciary Act of 1802, it set forth the idea that the justice of the Supreme Court residing within the said circuit. Thus, they began a geographical tradition of the court. But, but by the end of the circuit riding requirements, and the circuit riding requirements did not end until 1891, presidents have become more, less and less dependent on selecting justices by region. But it still continues. President Hoover declined to nominate that same judge, Benjamin Cardozo, on the ground that two New York, uh, there were already two New Yorkers sitting on the court. Justice Stone, a New Yorker, then offered Hoover that he would step down by the, from the court if Justice Cardozo could be selected to replace him. Hoover went ahead with Cardozo's selection, and Stone didn't have to give up his seat. So it was kind of bait and switch. So we ended up with three New Yorkers at that time. Nixon played an interesting regional card in 1971 when Justice Black seat became available, hoping to garnish electoral support among Southern conservatives, aforementioned, or I haven't mentioned it yet, Dixiecrats, what we call Dixiecrats, Southern conservatives, who had traditionally voted for the Democrat Party Nixon tried to choose a Southerner to try to win them over. The Southern strategy that Nixon put together, and that's what it was called, the Southern strategy, resulted in one after the other failed nominations. Clement Hainsworth and Harold Carswell, in fact, backfired somewhat, but after the successful nomination of replaced back, Black, we ended up with the liberal-leaning swing justice known as Justice Lewis Powell. Powell was later to become influential, critical, in the decisions in uh, contraceptive cases and also in Roe versus Wade. Now, geography still is in there. Uh, we have consistently had a New England seat. We've consistently had a New York seat. And up until 1861 in the Civil War, we consistently had what was called a Maryland, Virginia seat. But this has not been the case because of their stance, especially Virginia's, against the country. Another factor influencing selection is religion, race, and gender. Of the 147 people nominated to the Supreme Court, 145, 98.6% have been white. 145, 98.6% have been male. And 126, or 85.7%, have been Protestant. Okay? White, male, Protestants. The sole blacks on the court were are Thurgood Marshall and Clarence Thomas. The sole women have expanded twofold. We have Sandra Day O'Connor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but we also have Sotomayor and Elena Kagan. Of the white Protestants, almost all of them have been Anglo-Saxon. Our first Italian justice was Antonin Scalia. Of the non-Protestants, nine have been Jewish and 12 have been Roman Catholic. The first Catholic nominated, as we all know, was Roger Tawney. Remember, he was nominated, rejected, renominated, and finally took his seat in 1836. The second Catholic, after 1836, would not be until 1894 with the selection of Edward White. Since then, though with the exception of eight years, there has been at least one Catholic in the court since then. In fact, we have quite a few Catholics on the court. Cardinal Spellman, an influential um, social cleric, 
actively lobbied, the, la, 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 lobbied for the selection of Justice Brennan to the court in 1956. Brennan later voted for women's rights to abortion, and Cardinal Smellman stuck back as the court <coughs> sought to excommunicate Brennan. Two Catholic high times was 1988-89. We had three Catholics sitting on the court together, Brennan, Scalia, and Kennedy. Today, there are more than four. We have Kennedy, Alito, Roberts, Thomas, who converted from Episcopalianism, and Sotomayor. There is also a supposed Jewish seat, which began with the selection of Louis Brandeis in 1916. And it existed on the court until Justice Abe Fortas resigned in 1969 because Nixon then replaced him with a Protestant. Reagan had attempted to reinstall the Jewish seat with the selection of Douglas Ginsburg in 1987. But like I said before, he was forced to resign his candidacy when his, it was shown that he was smoking pot with his students while on the faculty of Harvard Law School. Clinton eventually reestablished a Jewish seat with his two selections of Breyer and Ginsburg. Another critical factor in selection or nomination is friendship and patronage. The simple fact is three-fifths of those nominated to the court personally knew the president who nominated them. Three-fifths. Washington selected personal friends to serve on the court. Truman nominated four of his longtime buddies, Burton, Vincent, Clark, and Minton. Johnson pushed hard for the nomination of Fortas, but failed to succeed him in pushing him off to the chief justice position because he already had another crony, Homer Thornberry, ready in the wings to replace the vacant associate seat left behind if Fortas was promoted. Nixon knew Rehnquist from his work in the Justice Department, although Nixon never really knew his name. He referred to him as Rentschler, and in pre-nomination taped conversations, he referred to uh, Rehnquist, a uh, Rentschler, as a clown. Governor Earl Warren, seeing his own future presidential campaign faltering through his support and the California Republican delegation to Eisenhower instead of Ike's rival, Robert Taft of Ohio. And a year later, Eisenhower paid back his friendship by nominating Governor Warren to the chief justice position to replace Vincent. Kennedy friend and All-American football player, Byron White, received a seat on the Supreme Court in 1962 just two years after organizing the group Citizens for Kennedy Johnson. Here are some of the uh, pictures to go with the lecture before. Partisan and ideology, traditions set by Washington, 130 of 149 selections, real politics, and issue orientation, especially by Nix, uh, Reagan, whoops, Freudian slip, nomination within the political environment, Ford selecting John Paul Stevens. You had a Democrat nominated Senate, so Ford picked the pragmatist Stevens that you see there in the lower right. Prior experience, public service is number one. Public service of all different forms. Out of judicial positions, 93 of 147 have prior judicial decisions. And we talked about the party difference uh, between the Republican Party and the uh, Democrat Party. Geography, we had the Judiciary Act of 1802, riding the circuit ended in 1891. Cardozo in the New York seat, Nixon playing the regional card and ultimately failing at it and it backfires, and the New England seat, the New York seat, and the Virginia, Maryland seat until 1861. Religion and race, some stats, the Catholic tradition, the Jewish tradition, 
friendship and par- patronage. Three fifths of uh, the people knew the president personally. It was a Washington tradition again, putting on his buddies. Truman, Buds, Burton, Vincent, Clark, and Minton, all serving on the Supreme Court. Vincent in the role of Chief Justice. Johnson's Bud Fortas trying to elevate him to Chief Justice so that Thornberry, Homer Thornberry, could step in. And Nixon, knowing uh, Rehnquist as Rentschler the Clown. (laughs) And, of course, Governor Warren, citizens for uh, Eisenhower, results in a job for him as Chief Justice. And Kennedy and the all-pro Byron White, uh, who organized an electoral group for Kennedy, payback being a position on the Supreme Court. Now, what I want to look at now is senatorial confirmation. And here I would like you to refer to a file that I put up on Canvas known as the Siegel and Cover Story, a study, excuse me. That's Siegel and Cover is below there, okay? The Siegel cover, uh, cover Study looks at nominees, margins, vote status, ideology, and qualifications. So take a look at that printout on Canvas as you go through this section. Well, in sum, the presidential uh, the president has success rate uh, sorry success rates through 2003 and from the beginning had only failed to confirm 27 nominations so that's 16.7% not confirmed now as compared to cabinet success the cabinet success um only 8.3 are not confirmed in the 19th and 20th century so obviously there's much more politics to be played and because of the long-term nature you're a cabinet member until you resign or the president is voted out or the two terms are up so the maximum of eight years you put a young enough supreme court justice in position you've got him or her for 20 30 years now The 20th century president has been more successful than the others, okay? Um, And in fact, they've only been defeated roughly the same as cabinet nominees, about 8.3%, okay? But it hides harder times. The early part of the century, uh, the 20th century, Presidents were getting their nominees through at much greater rates than after 1949. After 1949, four were defeated. And 14 received more than 10 negative votes. So it's much harder since 1949 to get uh, cabinet posts or cabinet. Ah, what am I saying? Since 1949, it's much harder to get Supreme Court nominees onto the court. It's become much more of a ball game played by both parties, depending whoever's in control of the Senate. Now, I'm going to go into Supreme Court personnel. Okay, we're going to go in, but I want you to overview uh, the, the major personnel. The clerk of the court is an incredibly important position. The marshal of the court is an incredibly important position and the reporter of decisions is an incredibly important position. But what I'd like to do is go through each of these in turn, okay? Oh, and by the way, before I begin, SCOTUS personnel generally, it's the smallest part of the federal government. You have to remember that. Uh, The presidency is one of the largest simply because you have all those bureaucrats, all of those functionaries operating under the cabinet positions. The cabinet secretaries then have a huge glut of um, bureaucrats, federal bureaucrats. And of course, Congress does too. I mean, Congress 538 plus all the bureaucrats working under them. So by far, the judicial branch is the smallest of all. Now, let's look at the clerk of the court. And since 2013, 
It's been Scott Harris. Now, around the mid-1990s, last time I can get solid uh, statistics, 325 people were employed in the Supreme Court. 325 people. And the operating budget is, is only $30 million. Uh, that's minuscule by uh, national debt standards. Okay. Now, the clerk of the court position uh, was first established in 1790. The clerk ensures that the court is able to carry on its constitutional duties, its judicial business, and in an orderly fashion. The duties of the clerk of the court involve administration of court doc, uh, dockets and argument calendars, receipt and recording of all motions, briefs, and petitions, distribution of various papers to justices, collection of filing fees, preparation of the order list and the journal issuance, meaning when will the case be heard, when will orders be disseminated, and of course the journal issuance, preparation of the formal judgments, Notification to counsel in the case and all lower federal court of formal actions taken by the court, lower courts generally, not just federal state as well. Supervision of printing of briefs and also the appendices to that informal pauperous case. Remember, we talked about that with Gideon versus Wainwright, the form of brief that a poor person would use. Well, the poor person gets the assistant assistance of the clerk of the court but the clerk's duties are not under uh, not uh, over they, he or she also secures receipt of certified records before a grant of review is undertaken so any kind of record from the lower court must be uh, gained and secured and certified supervision of admissions for attorneys to the supreme court bar remember it's a favor Oh, well, it's not a favor to those who have to litigate in front of the Supreme Court. They are given us uh, admission to the Supreme Court bar. But you also grant that for lifelong attorneys and judges. Um, and it's an honor then to be admitted to the Supreme Court bar. And the clerk of the court is constantly giving procedural advice to all parties in the court. Now. How do we fund the clerk of the court? For the first nine years, starting in 1790, the clerk position was not salaried at all. I don't know why a person would volunteer. But finally, in 1799, Congress provided the clerk receive $10 a day for his attendance in the court and double the fees the clerk would have received if employed in his home state. Okay, so $10 a day plus double the fee of the average clerk from his home state. So say a clerk in, in the state of Massachusetts would be receiving $5 a day. Well, then it was $10 a day to attend the court and $10 a day double the clerk would have received in his home state. For the next 100 years, the salaries were augmented as well by filing fees, all those fees to file action um, with, uh, before the court. And this was quite a greedy little enterprise because in 1881, think about this, 1881, the annual income of the clerk of the court was higher than $30,000. That's 1881 dollars. In the face of this, Oops. In the face of this, the clerk, uh, the Congress changed the rules, and now filing fees are paid to the U.S. Treasury, and the, the clerk is put on a salary. As of 1996, the clerk of the court receives $118,000 annual income. This contrasts greatly now with the Chief Justice at $217,000, and the Associate Justice is at $208,000. I'm sorry to slide advanced before I meant it to. The second critical role is Marshal of the Court. 
And since 2001, the marshal of the court is Pamela Talkin. The Judiciary Act of 1867 allowed for the creation of the marshal of the court. So it was created by the Judiciary Act of 1867. She is the building's general manager, paymaster, and chief security officer. Today, she attends all court sessions, manages 200 employees, and pays the justices and other employees. She also oversees telecommunications and orders supplies and pays any bills the court might have. Okay. So the major roles are building manager, pay manager, and chief security officer. She also oversees the Supreme Court police force. Yes, the Supreme Court has its own police force, which consists of a chief of police and 80 officers who secure the grounds and aid visiting dignitaries. At 10 a.m. on a court day when the court's holding session the marshal of the court announces the honorable and the chief justice and associate justice of the supreme court of the united states oh yay oh yay oh yay all persons having business before the honorable the supreme court of the united states are admonished to draw near and give their attendance for the court is now sitting god save the united states and this honorable court this is said to at the beginning of the conduct of an oral argument day. Now, the marshal is also directed to serve all the papers of the court, just like a local sheriff or federal marshal would serve them um, more regionally or locally. So either they do it directly or they hand it off to U.S. Marshal's office for service of process. Third critical uh, role played in the uh, structure of the Supreme Court, is that played by the reporter of decision. Since 2011, that position has been filled by Christine Luchow Fallon. The reporter of decision is responsible for editing the opinions of the uh, opinions of the court and supervising their printing and publication in the official document known as United States Reports. She and her staff of nine check all citations and uh, typographical and other errors. And they also look over the pro preliminary prints of these decisions. Okay. So they make sure that the names of the justices are correct, the counselors are correct, and that the public uh, version will be correct. The court decisions and orders are then first circulated as preliminary prints and then printed by the U.S. Government Printing Office. Okay. The other interesting historical fact is the reporter of decision is used as the premise of citing the case. Um, now, until before the U.S. report system, U.S. report system was established, the decisions were cited by the reporter of decisions. For instance, 1 Krantz 137 is better known as Marbury versus Madison. The Krantz here is the reporter of decision at, in that date, 1803. 4 Wheaton 316, an 1819 case, is better known as McCulloch versus Maryland. Now, Wheaton is the reporter of decision here, okay? Now, what do these numbers mean? The first number, 1 Krantz 137, means volume 1, the, 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 the reports of the court under Krantz, the reporter of decision, page 137. Volume 4 of Wheaton, reporter of decisions, page 316. And it's that simple. In fact, that's how simple the structure of the Supreme Court actually is. So please review, and I will be posting some practice quizzes in the very near future, today, tomorrow, so that you can understand, if you understand, 
the roles and duties of the various characters uh, that make up the U.S. Supreme Court. Thank you.